It is with just great, great pleasure that, uh, that I introduce our next guest. Uh, you know, we often talk about that facts don't change behavior, stories do. And, uh, and it's incredible stories of health, of hope, of healing. And, uh, and our next speaker truly does embody that. She is board certified in lifestyle medicine, a, a new board that uh, the first cohort was certified in 2017 through the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. She's also certified in infectious disease. She's the founder and owner of Stansick Health and Wellness. Uh, she's a prolific speaker, now speaking all across the country and around the world on her personal journey that she will share with you today. She's also the producer of a documentary that is now screening in many places across the country and will be distributed nationwide soon called Code Blue. And it focuses on this urgent need to embed lifestyle medicine into our medical education system across the country and around the world as well. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Sarai Thank so Stancic. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely Good afternoon. It is a great pleasure to be here, Susan. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I'd like to begin this afternoon by simply taking a moment to introduce myself to you personally. My name is Sarai Stancic. It's not an easy name. And I have been a physician for 25 years. By training, I am an internist and infectious disease specialist, a field I became deeply interested in as a young medical student. You see, I went to medical school in Newark, New Jersey in the late 80s, early 90s. And regrettably, that period was coincident with the height of the HIV epidemic. And as you might imagine, within that experience, I witnessed unspeakable human suffering and loss, and I wanted to be part of that solution. So when I completed my chief resident year in internal medicine, I went on to a fellowship in infectious diseases. Now, it's important for me to say this. I'm very proud of the work that I did in the field of infectious diseases over nearly 20 years, not only in patient care, but also in research, helping to develop better treatments for those affected. But today, I no longer practice infectious diseases. Today, I practice lifestyle medicine. Now, how many of you have heard of lifestyle medicine? This is a highly educated and evolved crowd, right? So lifestyle medicine is a relatively new discipline whose focus it is to educate and empower patients on the importance of optimal nutrition, a primarily plant-based diet, physical activity, stress management, effective sleep hygiene, the avoidance of tobacco, near reduction or elimination of alcohol, and the importance of social interconnectedness. We know, for example, that depression and isolation fuel chronic disease and premature death. Now, why is all of this so important? It's important because the scientific literature tells us that when we address these parameters, we can indeed prevent nearly 80% of chronic disease. Isn't that amazing? Extraordinarily powerful. But the logical question you may have for me is, how does an infectious disease specialist with the background I just described to you evolve into a passionate advocate and practitioner of lifestyle medicine? Well, in order for me to effectively answer that question, I need to share with you two separate experiences that occurred in my life that have shaped who I am today. One of them is a personal story and the other a professional one. So I'd like to begin with my personal story. And for that, I'm going to take you back to October 11, 1995. On this particular day, I was a third year medical resident and I was on call at Beth Israel Medical Center. And it was a really, really, really busy night. You know, one of those nights where your pager just doesn't stop ringing. I was literally running from the ICU to the emergency room and back to the general ward all night. And it wasn't until sometime in the mid-morning hours where I found the opportunity to make it back to the on-call room. I remember making my way there and feeling so deeply fatigued, something I had never experienced before. The minute my head hit that pillow, lights out. Shortly thereafter, as you might imagine, in the midst of that very busy call, I was paged yet again to address another urgent patient matter. But this time, when I tried to get up out of that sleeping position, 
an extraordinary thing happened. I couldn't feel my legs. I remember reaching down to touch them, and they felt as if they were someone else's. Panic set in, and next thing I knew, I, or I remembered rather, was the emergency room where I underwent an MRI of my brain and spinal cord, and those studies confirmed a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis with multiple lesions in both my brain and spinal cord. And so just like that, everything changed. I was no longer that young, healthy, vibrant physician that had walked through the hospital doors earlier that morning. I was now a chronic illness patient admitted to the hospital. And with that came what I call the era of drug dependency as the parade of pharmaceuticals marched into my life. I was immediately started on IV steroids to treat that acute event, and then multiple medicines to treat my now failing bladder, peripheral neuropathy, spasticity, and pain. I was discharged after five days and told to come back in a week because it was then that I would start what my doctors referred to as the DMT, or disease modifying therapy. They told me this was the key to slowing the progression of this chronic neurologic disabling disorder, and without it, I would likely be in a wheelchair within 20 years. Difficult words to hear when you're 28 years old. Of course, I was going to do whatever my doctors asked of me. So I returned a week later. My doctor sat me down, and he said, Sarai, I want you to know that although this drug is quite effective, it's not going to be easy. This is a medicine that you will have to inject every day. And I said, for how long? And he said, for the rest of your life. He said, this is a drug that has a significant side effect profile that includes fever, chills, muscle aches and pains, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, anorexia, insomnia, injection site reactions, depression, and suicidal thoughts, to name a few. But he said, don't worry, because I know exactly what to do to reduce the likelihood that you'll ever experience any of those side effects. So my ears perked up. He said, 30 minutes before you eject a drug, you're going to pre-medicate with Tylenol or ibuprofen. And secondly, and most importantly, you're going to inject the drug right before you go to bed. This way, you'll sleep through all the side effects. Ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you that not once did I sleep through the side effects. I would inject the drug at 10 o'clock, and at 2 o'clock in the morning, I would awaken with violent shaking chills, fever, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. After doing this for a couple of weeks, I didn't think I could do it much longer. I picked up the phone to let him know I was calling it quits. But of course, before I could get a word in edgewise, he advised me that was not a prudent decision, and he implored me to reconsider it. Reminded me of the wheelchair, in case I had forgotten. He said, look, I know it's difficult. I know this side effect profile is challenging, but I know exactly what, we, what to do. What we'll do is we'll treat the side effects of this drug with other drugs. So when I couldn't sleep at night, I was given a prescription for Ambien. When I couldn't wake up in the morning, I was given a prescription for Provigil, an amphetamine-like drug. And when I became depressed, I was given a prescription for Prozac. By the time I was in my early 30s, I had snowballed into this chronic illness patient dependent on nearly a dozen drugs to get through a typical day. And despite all of those medicines, my disease progressed and my quality of life suffered immensely. Eight years into the diagnosis, I was largely dependent on a cane or set of crutches. And to be frank, I began to lose hope. And then in 2003 came what I call my aha moment. And it came in the oddest of ways. So I was sitting in my office, at this point, Chief of Infectious Diseases at the VA in New York. And my secretary walks into the office to deliver the Daily Mail, as she would every day. But on this particular day, she dropped this big stack on my desk. It caught my attention. I looked over. And on top of this stack, I saw a journal. And on the cover of that journal, I saw three words, multiple sclerosis, and of all things, blueberries. And I thought to myself, what in the world could blueberries have to do with multiple sclerosis? 
So I dropped everything. I picked up the journal and I turned to the article. And of course, what I found was a poorly constructed, unscientific study that essentially took a small group of MS patients, fed them a diet rich in blueberries, and the authors had the audacity to conclude that those patients that ate the blueberry-rich diet felt better. Not a very objective clinical endpoint. Here I was a physician, a scientist. I couldn't believe that anyone had, had conducted such a, such a study, and then someone actually published it. I had lunch with a colleague of mine that afternoon. I told him about it. He laughed, and so did I. But there was something about this silly little blueberry study that I couldn't get out of my head. And it wasn't that I thought eating blueberries was going to solve my problem. A much more important question surfaced from that line of thinking. For the first time in my adult life, as a practicing physician, I considered the following question. Could there be a connection between diet and disease? Now, if anyone could answer that question, you would think I'd be able to. I mean, I was a physician, right? Four years in medical school, another four as an internal medicine resident, another two years as an infectious disease fellow. That was a decade of my life dedicated to higher education in the field of medicine. And I couldn't think of one example in which one of my professors, mentors, or educators ever connected those two dots. But I remained curious, likely because I was desperate. I decided to look into this question myself. So I turned to the scientific literature looking for answers. So I went to PubMed, you know, the search engine, and I typed in words like multiple sclerosis and diet, chronic disease and diet. And what I got back, of course, was nothing short of remarkable. And this was one of the first studies that I came across, published in 1952, so 67 years ago, in the New England Journal of Medicine by Dr. Roy Swank. And, then, and in this publication, Dr. Swank writes about the incidence of multiple sclerosis in Norway, which, by the way, has one of the highest rates of MS globally. And he specifically looks at the geographic locations and notes that the highest rates are happening in the inner farming dairy community, where he notes they're consuming large amounts of saturated fat, butter fat, animal fat. And he compares this to those Norwegians that are living on the coast that are consuming primarily fish and vegetation. And back in 1952, Dr. Swank hypothesized that somehow saturated fat was playing a role in the pathogenesis and evolution of multiple sclerosis. Now, Swank didn't just leave it at hypothesis. He actually started treating patients in the 1950s where he practiced medicine in Portland, Oregon. And in fact, followed 140 plus patients on a low-fat plant-based diet over 20 years and reported his findings in the archives of neurology in 1970. But he didn't stop there. He followed this cohort an additional 14 years and ultimately reported his findings in the journal The Lancet in 1990. So what did Dr. Squank conclude after following 140 plus patients over 34 years on a low-fat plant-based diet. Those who adhered to the diet showed significantly less disability and lower mortality rates. Of those that survived, 95% remained physically active. Wow. I kept replaying those words in my mind. 95% remained physically active. That really resonated with me. I mean, the, the wheelchair, that my doctor kept bringing up scared me. 95% remained physically active. And you know, it wasn't just Swank. When I conducted my search back in 2003, there were several studies that corroborated and aligned with Dr. Swank's theory. And I was curious immediately, how was it that I had never learned this previously? How was it that my doctor, who was an MS specialist, one of the best in the country, hadn't asked me about my diet? How was that? Did he not know about this? So I decided he clearly doesn't know, so I have to educate him. So I made copies of all of these articles that I had come across, and off I went to meet with him. And yes, he looks just like this. He sat across the room from me. I reviewed all the articles that I had uncovered. I highlighted all the sections that I thought were relevant, 
and he was very kind and patient and heard everything I had to say. When I was done, he got up, walked over, put his hand on my shoulder, which I always say is a bad thing. And he said, listen to me, Sarai. I know you're an intelligent woman, you're an extraordinary physician. Do you really think, think of, you know, step out of this for a moment objectively, do you really think that changing your diet is going to in any meaningful way change the course of this chronic neurologic autoimmune disabling disorder? It's not. I know you don't want to hear this, but what you need to do is remain compliant with disease-modifying therapy. Eat what you want or what you enjoy. And if you want to blame anything for having MS, you can blame your genes because that's why you have MS and there's nothing you can do about that. So you might imagine I left that visit feeling quite deflated. Whatever hope I had conjured up had been swiftly washed away. But not for long, because I started to think more and more about my doctor's parting words, it's your genes, and it brought me back to an experience I had as an undergraduate at Rutgers University when I took a genetics course. And I remember the professor on one afternoon excitedly lecturing on monozygotic twins. And monozygotic twins are really very interesting from a geneticist perspective because you have two separate individuals have the same genetic material, and we can learn a lot from that example. And I started to think, I wonder if anyone's looked at this. If twin A has MS, what is the likelihood that twin B would have MS? That's what we call concordance rates. So again, I turned to the scientific literature looking for answers. And indeed, someone had looked at that question. It wasn't 100% as my doctor might have suggested. It wasn't even 50%. It was 14 to 33%. So some of that hope I had lost began to trickle back in, right? Because what did this tell me? It told me that it wasn't just my genes, that there were indeed other variables that were playing a role in the evolution of this disease. So again, I turned to the scientific literature looking for answers, and that's when I came across the science of epigenetics, first described in the 1950s, but really sort of flourished in the 1980s. And epigenetics essentially tells us that gene expression is dependent on outside variables, right? So that just because you have a gene or a set of, a set of genes that puts you at risk of developing a disease doesn't necessarily mean that you will develop that disease, right? That's the difference between genotype and phenotype. And what does epigenetics tell us is important in shutting genes on or off? Things like diet and nutrition, physical activity, stress, smoking, alcohol. Sounds a lot like lifestyle medicine, doesn't it? Yeah. And I love this image because it so beautifully summarizes epigenetics. We have this gentleman in the center of the slide. We see his DNA, double helix DNA in the center there. And on either side of him, two very distinct sets of decisions, right? On one side, we see an active man. He's consuming a whole food plant-based diet, windows open, producing uh, vitamin D, getting some sunlight. On the other side, we see a couch potato, television's roaring, he's consuming processed garbage. And we can see that he looks very different on his exterior, but we can imagine what the interior of the intima of his coronary arteries might look like, right? For sure, genes play a role, but don't kid yourself, lifestyle matters most. At some point, I had read enough. In 2003, I decided I needed to implement changes in my life. And I knew I wasn't going to get the support that I so desperately seeked to receive from my physician. I was going to have to go about this on my own. But fueled by all the data I had read and digested, I felt confident that what I was doing would ultimately bear fruit. So the first thing that I did was I changed my diet. And now, what diet did I choose? Did I choose an Atkins diet? Did I choose um, a keto diet? Did I choose what was trending at the time? No, I adopted a whole foods plant-based diet because 
The overwhelming body of scientific literature pointed to a diet rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds as being the optimal diet for human health. Not the MS diet, not the diabetes diet, not the heart disease diet, but the ideal diet for all of us. I began to exercise. Back in the 1990s, when you were diagnosed with MS, it was falsely believed that exercise exacerbated the disease. So I did nothing for eight years. I was highly deconditioned. So my husband bought me a stationary bike and would have to assist me to get onto it. And I could do a minute or two, and then exhausted and in pain, it would take me 10 to 15 minutes to recover. But the next day, I got back on, and the day after that, and the day after that. And little by little, I began to build endurance, strength, and stamina. Stress. I made it clear to my team at the VA that I was going to leave at 5 o'clock every day, unless there was a patient emergency. I was going to delegate projects. I wasn't going to take on that extra research. For the first time in my life, I was putting myself first. And you know what happened? It didn't happen in a week, and it didn't happen in a month, but I started to feel better. At first, it was something as subtle as I could stay up past Jeopardy. Or I got to work one day, and I felt confident enough to leave the cane in the car. I'm often asked, how long did it take before you realized that the decision you had made was the right one? And it's hard to say, but there is one particular day that I remember well, and I happen to have a photograph of it. It's July 2nd, 2005, and this is about two years into my lifestyle change. And on this day, I attended a wedding of a friend of mine. And I did two things on this day that were, for me, extraordinary. To you, will sound trivial. I wore heels, and I danced with my husband. Around this time, my brother came to visit me who lives in Los Angeles, and I don't get to see him as often as I'd like. We live on opposite coasts. He was so pleased to see me free of the cane, leaner, happier, hopeful. He said, it's nice to have my sister back. During that visit, he also had some good news for me. He had recently run the Los Angeles Marathon, and he was bragging about it. He was uh, excited about sharing photographs at the finish line. And then towards the end of the conversation, he looked at me and he said, I know this is going to sound crazy to you, but I think you should run a marathon. And I shot him a look like I wanted to kill him. I said, I can't run a marathon. I have multiple sclerosis. How dare you even suggest it? And I always say to my brother, it's the greatest gift he ever gave me, right? Because the minute I said those words out loud, I realized that I was living my life as this woman with MS. And with that label came so many limitations, so many things I could do and things I couldn't. And I realized then I needed to, to let go of that. So my brother uh, planted the seed, went back to Los Angeles. And without telling anybody, I went out a couple of times and I tried to do a little bit of jogging. Didn't go so well. My balance was off. I fell, scraped my knees, but I would heal up and try again. There's this little nature preserve right down the street from my home. It's called the Celery Farm. There's a small body of water in the center of it and a little path that goes around the edge. If you make it the entire way around, it's about a mile and a tenth. It's not very big. But I remember the first time I made it the entire way around without falling or stopping, I felt amazing, invincible. I called my husband and I said, you know, honey, I'm gonna, walk, I'm gonna run that marathon someday. I don't know when or how, but I'm gonna do it. And I'm happy to share with you that I did achieve that goal on May 2nd, 2010. I crossed the finish line at the New Jersey Marathon and it was an extraordinary moment for me, not just because I ran a marathon, but because this lifestyle change that everyone told me was, the, was going to be a mistake, had borne fruit. And today, I am 24 years since my diagnosis. I'm medication-free, disability-free, and empowered more than ever before to share 
this very simple but very powerful healing message with the world. So I told you there were two reasons why I am a passionate advocate of lifestyle medicine, my personal story, and now let's move on to my professional experience, which I believe is just as important. I began my career as an infectious disease specialist, and in that capacity, over nearly 20 years, like any other physician in this country, I witnessed and cared for patients with sequelae of chronic disease. In fact, most of our healthcare is allotted to the management of, of chronic diseases. In fact, 86% of the healthcare dollars are spent on the management of chronic disease. And of course, I'm referring to uh, what we might find on CDC's top 10 causes of death. It's no surprise to learn that heart disease and cancer are the number one and two causes of death in our country. In fact, those two alone account for 50% of all deaths. Now, we haven't always been dying of heart disease and cancer. If we were to look at this list, instead of dated 2016, 1900, what do you think would be the most common causes of death back then? Infectious diseases, yes. Right, I would have been a really busy doc, right, as an infectious disease physician in the 1900s. But of course, we lived in different conditions, right? We, didn't, we don't have but we don't have the hygienic conditions that we did back then. We have antibiotics today, we have antivirals, we have vaccines, so it's a different world, right? So we've made a lot of progress, that's great, right? So today we're not dying primarily of infectious diseases. Today we're dying primarily of diseases of excess, right? And that's reflected on here. Too much sugar, too much salt, too much fat, too much sitting, too much stressing. Diseases of excess. Reflected here, heart disease, cancer, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, right? Diabetes is exploding in our country, right? When I was in medical school 25 years ago, rates of diabetes in this country, 2%. Today, we're brushing past 10%. And the CDC ominously predicts that by 2050, by the time my son is my age, 30% of Americans will be diabetic. 30%. It's not sustainable. Our healthcare system will implode. Something we're doing in clinical medicine isn't working. Developing yet another drug to treat diabetes is not the solution to the problem. Let me show you what diabetes looks like when you are an infectious disease specialist. This is an infected diabetic foot ulcer, a common consult that I would get at the VA. Poorly controlled diabetic referred to me, and the question is, Dr. Stancic, what antibiotic should this patient be placed on and for how long? And I would examine these patients and debride um, the lesion and often find bone involvement. That's what we call osteomyelitis. Osteomyelitis is a very, very difficult infection to treat in anyone, but especially in diabetics. Because diabetics are poor wound healers, they have poor immune systems, poor vasculature, right? How do we get the antibiotic to the site? Through the blood vessel. So even when we put them on the right antibiotic and we debride these aggressively and we're really good about managing, some of these patients just end up like this. Right? They don't get better. So now you have a poorly controlled diabetic status post-amputation. Do you think this patient is going to sign up for a 5 k Probably not, right? They'll become more sedentary, gain more weight, blood sugar is further out of control, blood pressure goes up, and then the stroke or heart attack. And that was my life, right? These are the, the sequence of events that I would see in clinical practice. Now I'm seeing Mr. Jones, in the ICU setting, and the question I'm being asked is, can you help us manage the nosocomial or hospital-acquired pneumonia? And that's, this scenario that I just described to you is not unique to me. This happens every day in every hospital across our country, and no one bats an eye. Because diabetics, they develop strokes. They develop pneumonias when they're intubated. It happens. But this is deeply disheartening to me because I know that diabetes is largely preventable. And this event should, be, should happen on rare occasion, right? 
If you think about the natural history of type 2 diabetes, you know, when that 62-year-old patient shows up in my office with that infected diabetic foot ulcer, that didn't happen overnight. There's a lot of history that predates that presentation in my infectious disease clinic. Right? Maybe that gentleman's story starts in his late 20s when he starts a new job. And he's commuting into the city an hour and a half. It's a very stressful drive. And then he gets to his office and he sits behind a computer for eight to 10 hours and he feeds on some pizza or cheeseburger while at the desk. Somebody brings it over to him. He's so busy, he's so stressed. Then he gets back in his car, he drives another hour and a half, and then exhausted, he pulls into a drive-thru, picks up some food and maybe a six-pack, and then comes home, sits in front of the television, eats, drinks a couple of beers, passes out on the couch, next day, repeat. And his lifestyle, that poor sedentary lifestyle leads to excess weight, obesity, right? And obesity leads to insulin resistance. And insulin resistance, unchecked, patients fall into the pre-diabetic state. Hemoglobin A1C between 5.7 and 6.4. That's what I call the warning period. At this point, diabetes, the diagnosis of diabetes has not yet been made, but the patient is in that window. And in large part, patients are asymptomatic. They, they feel fine. They might complain. They really don't have any complaints. It's not until you actually develop diabetes, and that's when they, they start to complain of polyuria, polydipsia, and now they come to the healthcare setting. And we see blood sugars of 300, hemoglobin A1C of 7.58, and we make the diagnosis of diabetes. And now all hands on deck, the endocrinologist, the internist, the family practice physician, and what do we do? We write a prescription for medicine. And we usually start with metformin, that's our first line agent, and that's not enough, we add a second target, maybe a third. And when, when oral regimens are no longer effective, we switch over to insulin, right? But all of this up and down and up and down and up and down, we start to see damage to end organs we start to see sequelae. So patients start to complain about some of these complications, like they might report to you, you know, doc, I'm feeling this like numbness and tingling in my hands and feet, that glove and stocking distribution, diabetic neuropathy, or, you know, doc, when I climb up a flight of stairs, I'm starting to feel a little winded, or I feel a little heaviness in my chest, atherosclerosis, right? Or we might dip some urine and notice a little bit of protein spilling, early kidney damage. And then a few more years go by, and then we have that disabling catastrophic event, the heart attack, the stroke, blindness, amputation, renal failure, and then death. And that's the very sad story of type 2 diabetes. And I started to think about where I met this gentleman in his timeline, in his lifespan. Where was I? I was primarily here. Along with my friend, the neurologist, and my friend, the cardiologist, we were sort of concentrated there. And we were trying to put out this raging fire with what felt like a glass of water. I felt very, very ineffective. And I started to think, what if I could somehow travel in a time machine and meet this very same gentleman here during that warning period, during that pre-diabetic period? Could I introduce some intervention that could prevent all of this complications, all of this pain and suffering from happening? Or better yet, could I travel further back and meet him here and prevent the obesity from happening? Is there any evidence that we could prevent all of these complications? Or is it that if you have diabetes in your genes that there's nothing we can do? That we're destined to develop diabetes if it's written in our genes? What does the scientific literature tell us? This is the Diabetes Prevention Program, an important randomized clinical trial published in 2002 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And here, investigators looked at 3,200 pre-diabetics, so those patients in that warning period, not yet diabetic, hemoglobin A1C between 5.7 and 6.4, and patients were randomized to one of three arms. Metformin, which is the first line agent in, that we utilize in newly diagnosed diabetics. Lifestyle intervention, diet and exercise. 
and placebo, and patients were followed over two years. And here, what we want to learn is the clinical, the primary endpoint is, could we prevent diabetes, the diagnosis of diabetes? So how did metformin do compared to placebo? 31% reduction. So 31% of the time, it prevented the development of diabetes. That's pretty good, right? If we were able to prevent that catastrophic course that I just described, 31% of the time, that's pretty good. But metformin is a drug. It has a side effect profile. It has a cost. What about lifestyle intervention compared to placebo? How did it do? 58% reduction in the development of diabetes. Nearly twice as effective as metformin, yet today in clinical practice in the United States, more often than not, we just write for metformin. And yet, we have a randomized clinical trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the gold standard, that clearly tells us that lifestyle is twice as effective. What about other diseases that were on that top 10 list of causes of death? This is the POTSDAM study, an important study conducted. This article published in uh, Archives of Internal Medicine in 2009. An interesting uh, prospective observational study. They looked at 23,000 Germans and wanting to learn the following. What happens in those that live these four healthy lifestyle behaviors? Eating a healthy diet defined as one rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains with limited animal sources. Not smoking. Obviously, smoking the worst thing you could do. Exercise three and a half hours a week. It didn't take much. Just walk 30 minutes every day and maintaining a healthy weight. This is not asking a lot. So what type of benefit did those that, that adhere to these four healthy lifestyle behaviors uh, achieve? Those four healthy lifestyle behaviors, 80% reduction in chronic disease. But specifically, if you look at the details behind that number, 93% of diabetes was prevented. This is the disease I just told you is exploding in our country. We have the information, the understanding today in 2019 to prevent 93% of diabetes, and yet diabetes continues to grow in our country. 81% of heart attacks prevented. 600,000 Americans die every year. We could save 480,000 lives by simply promoting these healthy lifestyle behaviors. Half of strokes gone, and more than a third of malignancies preventable by simply adopting those four healthy lifestyle behaviors. Now, there's always a skeptic in the audience. Is this reproducible? Is this something, maybe there's something unique about the Germans. If we did this somewhere else, would we get the same kind of numbers? And I'm so glad you asked. This is another study published in 2014 in the Journal of American College of Cardiology. This is a Swedish study, uh, men, about 20,000 plus men. And here they wanted, to, again, the healthy lifestyle behaviors, specifically looking at heart disease. What did they conclude? Four out of five heart attacks prevented. So again, four out of five heart attacks prevented. I'm not a math whiz, but is that not 80%? It is. Ladies and gentlemen, this data is reproducible and it's incontrovertible. The power of lifestyle medicine is extraordinary, and we need to get this message out to our communities because it is life-saving. At some point in my career, I realized that although the work I was doing in infectious diseases was very important, I had come across or stumbled across something that was, I think, even more important. This idea that we could prevent 80% of disease I needed to speak to this. And so in 2012, I made the questionable decision, some considered irrational decision, to leave behind my work as an infectious disease specialist in New York. And I decided that I was going to, in the latter half of my career, dedicate my time and energy and research to this idea of lifestyle medicine. How, what could I do to spread this message? So the first thing I did was I opened a small practice and I hung a shingle that said, I'm a lifestyle medicine physician. And no one knew what that was. And I can tell you that my colleagues questioned my sanity. They said, what are you gonna do? You're gonna leave infectious diseases and you're gonna tell patients to eat plants? And I said, yes. <laughs> it was scary. I had zero patients, zero stream of referral. but. 
patients started to call and schedule appointments, and we started to do the work, and they started to shed the pounds, and they started to shed the prescriptions, and then they told their friends, and they shared it in their community. And you know, something really cool happened that I could have never predicted when I started my practice. I have about 42 patients in my practice that are also physicians. And that happened because at one point we had a patient in common. Like a diabetic came to see me who's been diabetic for 15 years and dependent on three medicines. They're hypercholesterolemic, they're hypertensive, they're carrying an extra 60 pounds. And we talk about lifestyle modification. And we support that transition. The patient loses his 60 pounds and we, we taper off all of those medicines. And then he goes to see his endocrinologist for his yearly visit. And the endocrinologist says, oh my god. You look amazing, you've lost 60 pounds, your hemoglobin A1C is 5.4, and you're off of all, all your medicines, what have you done? I'm seeing Dr. Stancic, she's a lifestyle medicine physician. Give me her number. Then they call me and they're sort of angry at first, questioning what am I all about, and then we have a conversation, and I, first thing I say is give me your email address, I'm going to send you some, some articles to read and we share the peer-reviewed medical literature, and we have a discussion, and then they call me back and they say, you know what, I wanna come see you. And I think, okay, sure, come, and we'll have a cup of tea, we'll, we'll talk, and no, I, I wanna see you as a patient, because I'm sick. I'm depressed, my blood pressure's too high, and I'm pre-diabetic. So that was an extraordinary thing for me. Of course, every patient that I have is a blessing and a, and a privilege to care for them, but when I have a patient who's also a physician, that's an extraordinary thing because it not only helps them, but I know it changes the way they practice medicine looking forward, and that's pretty powerful. I love what I was doing, and I wanted to share it with as many people as possible, so I did what I could to get the word out about lifestyle medicine and the power that it offers us. And so I did a lot of public speaking, uh, sat for interviews and articles, podcasts, anything to get the word out. One of the common things that I kept getting from my patients who were doctors and as I traveled across the country and spoke to audiences of physicians and healthcare professionals, one of the things they always asked me, or at least brought up and we discussed was, why weren't we taught this in medical school, right? It's an important question. Why weren't we taught this in medical school? Such an extraordinarily powerful intervention, and yet medical school misses this altogether. Right? This poor gentleman thinks he missed the class. Of course he didn't. We just don't get any nutrition education in medical school. It's near absurd, right? In fact, only one in four medical schools meet the federal requirements for nutrition education, which, by the way, are a joke. It's 25 hours over four years. And the nutrition education that some schools do give, it's not really nutrition education. They'll teach you how to treat scurvy. It's not what we need, right? And the sad part is that the general population, the community believes that physicians are the best and most credible source for nutrition education, and yet we're just like everyone else. We know just as much as anybody else in the community. There's a wonderful paper written by David Eisenberg, David Eisenberg uh, from Harvard entitled Nutrition Education in an Era of Global Obesity and Diabetes, and in this paper, he really sort of outlines the problem for us and even offers some solutions. Some of the problems, just to help you understand why uh, we have this lapse in nutrition education. 71% of incoming medical students think nutrition is clinically important, which is great, right? So if you intuitively, if you're somebody who wants to pursue a field in the field of medicine, you intuitively believe that nutrition is important. But by the time you graduate, only half believe that nutrition is important. It's like the experience in medical school convinces you that it's not that important. Cardiology training. In order to complete a cardiology fellowship, you must complete 100 cardiac casts. That's part of the expectation. Right? But zero hours of nutrition. In fact, the AC graduate medical education uh, book that summarizes all the expectations that you need to complete 
to become a cardiologist. It runs 42 pages, and the words diet and lifestyle do not appear once in that compilation of expectations, which is extraordinary to me, because cardiology is the field in which we have the most evidence. Medical boards do not test on nutrition or lifestyle, and this is critically important because the medical school is going to teach what's on the boards because it reflects on their medical school. They want their medical students to do well. Medical boards are not testing on this topic. I can tell you that I just recently took my boards. Every 10 years, we have to get recertified in our specialty. I, I just took my internal medicine boards for the third time this past October. Not one question on nutrition or lifestyle, and I was looking. 94% of physicians feel that nutrition counseling should be part of primary care visits, but only 14% feel qualified to offer it. So we're flatlining here. We're really missing a golden opportunity to train healthcare professionals that are equipped to deliver this all-important, life-saving message. Let me ask any clinicians in the room, if you saw this tracing at bedside, what would you do? You're right, you would call a code blue, right? This is a shameless plug for my film. <laughs> and so that's what Code Blue is about, and it's a, a project that I've been working on over four years, is really about shining light on the absurd fact that the medical education system as it stands today completely misses this all important point. And of course, in making a documentary, we wanna catalyze change. We wanna, we wanna introduce uh, this idea so that we can get those that create me medical curricula to change what they're doing. Because we need doctors and nurses and pharmacists and physicians, everybody in the, that is involved in the healthcare professional experience to be uh, well versed in the topic of lifestyle medicine, understand the power that lies on our plate. It's not just me who thinks the medical education uh, system is off. This is coming from the American Medical Association as medicine and healthcare delivery in our nation continue to evolve in new and exciting ways, the US medical education system, which is based largely on an education model more than a century old, has not kept pace, right? And what is it exactly, what am I talking about? What is the antiquated medical education model? Currently, what we train physicians on is this idea of pathogenesis. So when you go to medical school, you learn the mechanism by which disease is caused. So I always say, you know, we train disease detectives. We're very good at that, right? We collect clues, right? History, physical, we ask questions, we examine you. We do uh, blood tests and imaging studies all in an effort to create a differential diagnosis. And then ultimately, we make a diagnosis. And once we have that diagnosis, we then implement a therapeutic intervention that typically includes a pharmaceutical or a surgical intervention or sometimes both. And of course, that is so important. That is an important lesson that, of course, we all need to learn in medical school. But the problem with medical school is that we miss the mirror image of that. We don't understand or learn anything about salutogenesis, which is the mirror image of pathogenesis. Salutogenesis is the process through which health and well-being are produced. We've never been told, here's Mr. Jones, Dr. Stan said, keep him healthy. We don't know how to do that. And that's what we need to change. We need to introduce into the curricula of medical schools modules that focus on nutrition, exercise, sleep, mindfulness, self-care. It's another important topic here. Physicians don't know how to take care of themselves. Do you know that physicians have the highest rates of suicide of any profession? It's terrible. I mean, we are the representatives of health in our community, and we do not know how to care for ourselves. My hope is that our film and organizations like the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and LMED, all of these important, the Plantrition Project, are bringing this to the forefront, the importance of nutrition as a medical intervention, a powerful medical intervention. And when we change the perspective of the way the physician thinks, we will create an extraordinary new healthcare system, a true healthcare system, not the sick care system that we have today. A new generation of physicians empowered to address the current healthcare climate. And I wanna leave you with the Hippocratic Oath. 
We're in May, June, we have graduations happening, so a lot of uh, young men and women graduating across the country, standing up after four years of medical school and, and citing the Hippocratic Oath. I remember doing uh, this in 1993 when I graduated from medical school and having my parents, my family there. Um, it was a, a very special moment for me, and there, this is a, a sacred, sacred oath that means a lot uh, to those of us who care, who have the privilege of caring for, for patients. There are 340 words included in the modern version of the Hippocratic Oath, but I submit to you that none more important than these 13. I will prevent disease whenever I can, for prevention is preferable to cure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sarai Stancic. What an inspirational story, and uh, so appreciate you. Yes, thank you, thank you. And, uh, and Sarai is an active member in the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and such a champion for the field as we work to transform health and healthcare. And what a way to close out today, the medical education track.